And Moshe said, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, and shall buy them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom to everyone worshiping with us at home. It's a blessing to be here today, and I'm looking forward to giving this message. We're going to wind up reading a lot today, and I really need, uh, really need for everybody to stay on top of things because we've got a lot of ground to cover, okay? And the name of the message today is called Paul Said What? Um, the reason I chose this name for this message is because there's a lot of people who believe that Paul taught something that is quite contrary to Paul's actual testimony about his message and his walk. Paul says that he never taught anything like what they, what, what he is said to have uh, been taught, had said to taught, teach. <laughs> Upon hearing this, there are many who might say, Paul said what? But we will look at Paul's own testimony, and you can decide for yourself. The next thing that I want to say is this. Paul did not come here to straighten Yahshua out. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. It is the other way around. As a matter of fact, Paul talks about that too. Okay? And so let's turn to Acts chapter 9. And uh, and we're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Acts today. And... And, and you'll understand why as we, as we get to the end here. Uh, Acts chapter 9. And in, in the previous chapter, Paul is giving his approval to the murder of Stephen, Stephanos, because he's been persecuting the assemblies of the Nazarenes for a while. And, um, of course, the Nazarenes are the followers of Yahshua. All right? Now... In Acts 9, 1 it says, But Shaul, still breathing threats and murder against the taught ones of the master, having come to the high priest, asked for him, uh, from him letters to the congregation of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, that's what the followers of Yahshua was called, whether men or women, to bring them bound to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And it came to be, that as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light flashed around him from the heaven, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Shaul, Shaul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Master? And the Master said, I am Yahshua, whom you persecute. It is hard for you to kick against the prods. Both trembling and being astonished, he said, Master, what do you wish me to do? And the Master said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you shall be told what uh, you have to do. And the men journeying with him stood speechless, hearing indeed the voice, but seeing no one. And Shaul arose from the ground. But when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and did not eat or drink. Now, he didn't eat or drink because he couldn't see. He didn't eat or drink because he was so upset. I mean, all right. And there was at Damascus, verse 10, a certain taught one by the name Hananiah. And the master said unto him in a vision, Hananiah. And he said, Here I am, master. And the master said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and seek in the house of Yehuda for one called Shaul of Tarsus. For look. He is praying, and has seen in a vision a man named Hananiah coming in and laying his hand on him so as to see again. And Hananiah answered, Master, I have heard from many about this man, how many evils he did to your set-apart ones in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to, to bind all those calling on your name. But the master said to him, Go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before nations, sovereigns, and the children of Israel. For I shall show him 
how much he has to suffer for my name. And Khan and Yahweh went away and went into the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Shaul, the master Yahshua, who appeared to you on the way as you came, has sent me so that you might see again and be filled with a set-apart spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it were, scales, and he received his sight, and rising up, he was immersed. And having received food, he was strengthened. And Shaul was with the taught ones at Damascus some days. And immediately he proclaimed the Messiah in the congregations that he is the son of Elohim. That's a big change in Shaul's presentation right there. Okay? Remember, the chapter before, he's given his approval to the killing of these folks. Right? And now he is one of them. All right. Verse 21, And all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those calling on the name in Jerusalem and has come here for us to take them bound to the chief priests? But Shaul kept increasing in strength and was confounding the Yehudim who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is the Messiah. And after many days had elapsed, the Yehudim, that'd be the Jews, plotted to kill him. But the plot became known to Shaul, and they were watching the gates day and night to kill him. But taking him by night, the taunt ones led him down through the wall, lowering him in a basket. And having arrived at Jerusalem, Shaul tried to join the taunt ones, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was a taunt one. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the emissaries, and told them how he had seen the emissaries of the apostles, the emissaries, and told them how he had seen the master on the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he was speaking boldly at Damascus in the name of Yahshua. And he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and speaking boldly in the name of the master Yahshua, and disputed with the Hellenists. Okay? He's not just confounding the Talmudic type of Jews, he's, 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 he's disputing with the Hellenist Jews. But they undertook to kill him. He's not being very popular right now. All right? And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsos. Then indeed, the assemblies throughout all Yehuda and Galil and Shomeron had peace and were built up and walking in fear of Yahweh and in the encouragement of the set-apart spirit, they were being increased. Okay, now what I'd like to do is we're going to skip over a good bit of Acts, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 21. See, so what we needed to do is lay a little uh, foundation there for what was going on with Paul and how he got from a persecutor to being persecuted. Acts chapter 21, verse 10. And they were staying many days at a certain... Uh, I'm sorry. And as they were staying many days, a certain prophet named Chagab came down from Yehuda, And having come to us, he took the girdle of Shaul, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the set-apart spirit, Thus shall the Yehudim, the Jews, at Yerushalayim, Bind the man who owns this girdle and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, both we and those from that place begged him not to go up to Jerusalem. And Shaul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Master Yahshua. And as he could not be persuaded. We ceased saying, let the desire of the master be done. And after those days, having made ready, he went up to Jerusalem. And also some of the taught ones from Caesarea went with us and brought with them one Manasseh of Cyprus, an early taught one with whom we were to lodge. And when we had arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. And on the following day, Shaul went with us to Yaakob 
and all the elders came. This is Yaakov, this is the brother of Yahshua, this is the head of the apostles in Jerusalem. That's who he's brought to, okay? And having greeted him, he, Paul, was relating one by one what Elohim had done among the Gentiles through his service. And when they heard it, they praised the master. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of Yehudim there are who have believed, and all are, what are those next four words? Ardent for the Torah. Okay? This is where we're going to start focusing a little bit on uh, what, Paul, uh, what Paul's, Shaul's message and his walk was really about. All right? All are ardent for the Torah. Verse 21. And they have been informed about you that you teach all the Yehudim who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moshe, Moses, saying not to circumcise the children nor to walk according to the practices. Have you ever heard that about Paul? Have you ever heard people say that about Paul? Okay. Well, that's what they had heard in Paul's day as well. All right? Then Jacob says, What then is it? They shall certainly hear that you have come, so do this, what we say to you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be cleansed with them and pay their expenses so that they shave their heads and all shall know that what they have been informed about you is not so, but that you yourself also walk orderly, what are those next three words? Keeping, Keeping the Torah. Okay? But concerning the Gentiles, verse 25, who believe we have written and decided that they should keep themselves from what is offered to idols and blood and what is strangled and whoring. Then Shaul said, I'm not doing that. I do teach uh, not to circumcise the children, and I don't walk orderly keeping the Torah. Is that what yours says? Neither does mine. Rewind. <laughs> then Shaul uh, uh, took the men on the next day, and having been cleansed with them, went into the set-apart place to announce the completion of the days of separation until the offering should be presented for each one of them. Huh. So why would Paul do this? Well, it was done to show all the people that what they had been informed about him was not so. All right? But that he himself walked orderly, keeping the Torah. Amen? Okay? Now, Paul, Paul was not a pushover. Okay? Paul, uh, Paul had been stoned and beaten and, and left for dead and thrown overboard. And, 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 and a lot of this stuff that, that happened to him that we didn't read about because we skipped over a bunch of chapters. And he even went up and, and, and rebuked Peter to his face. Okay, so if Paul thought something was wrong with what they were asking him to do, it's highly, highly unlikely that Paul would have just went along with it. All right? But what did Paul do? Paul went along with it. And he didn't just go along with it. He went along with it to show that he did walk orderly according to the Torah and that he was not teaching against Moshe and not to circumcise the children. All right? Okay. That's why he did that. Verse 27. And when the uh, seven days were almost ended, the Yehudim from Asia, seeing him in the set-apart place, were stirring up all the crowd, and they laid hands on him, crying out. Now, look at what they're saying. Look at what they're saying. Men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching all men everywhere against the people and the Torah and this place. You see... That's the very reason that he went with the men into the set-apart place, to prove that that wasn't going on, okay? And this is what they're doing. Until the offering could be made for each one, right? To show that what they had been informed about him was not so, but he is still being charged with it, okay? 
Continue in verse 28. And besides, this is what they're saying, he also brought Greeks into the set-apart place and has profaned the set-apart place because they had previously seen uh, uh, Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the set-apart place whom they thought that Shaul had brought into the set-apart place. They thought it. They didn't know it for sure. All right? And the entire city was moved and the people rushed together, seized Paul, and dragged him out to the set-apart place. Out of the set-apart place, excuse me. And immediately the doors were shut. And while they were seeking to kill him, a report came to the commander of the company of soldiers that all Yerushalayim was in confusion. At once, he took soldiers and captains and ran down to them, and they, having seen the commander and the soldiers, stopped beating Shaul. Okay? He's, he's, he's getting wore out here. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and was asking who he was and what he had done. And in the crowd, some were shouting this and others that, and not being able to ascertain the truth because of the uproar, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he came to the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. With a large number of the people, I'm sorry, for a large number of the people followed after crying out, away with him. And as Shaul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, Am I allowed to say somewhat to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Mitzrite who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 assassins out in the wilderness? But Shaul replied, I am a Yehudit from Tarsos and in Kilikia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. And having given him permission, Shaul, standing on the stairs, motioned with his hands to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke in the Hebrew language, saying, verse, chapter 22, verse 1, Men, brothers, and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he was speaking to them in the Hebrew language, they kept greater silence. And he said, this is what Paul says, I am indeed a Yehudi, a Jew. Right? Having been born in Tarsos of uh, Kilikia, but brought up in the city uh, at the, I'm sorry, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, having been instructed according to the exactness of what? Of the Torah of our fathers, being ardent for Elohim as you all are today. That doesn't sound like what he's being charged with. It kind of sounds like the opposite, doesn't it? Okay, well, let's, that's what people still say today, right? Okay, let's keep going. Verse, 20, uh, verse 4. As you all are today who persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering up into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the eldership from whom I also received letters to the brothers, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. And it came to be, as I was journeying and coming near Damascus about noon, suddenly a great light shone around me out of the heaven, and I fell on the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Shaul, Shaul, why do you persecute me? And I answered, Who are you, Master? And he said to me, I am Yahshua of Nazareth, whom you persecute. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear his voice speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Master? And the Master said to me, Rise up, go into Damascus, and there you shall be told all that you have been appointed to do. And as I could not see because of the esteem of that light, being led by the hand those who, by those who were with me, I came into Damascus. And a certain Hananiah, this is what Paul's saying, a dedicated man according to the Torah. Now, why would, why would Yahshua send Paul to a dedicated man according to the Torah? I mean, that Torah stuff is all over and done with now that Yahshua's been crucified, right? You don't think so? Hmm. 
don't think so either. <laughs> or it might be that we've all been told a lie. I mean, all right. Continuing on in verse 12. Talking about Han and Yah, being well spoken of by all the Yehudim dwelling there. Came to me and stood by and said to me, Brother Shaul, look up. And at that same hour, I looked up at him and he said, The Elohim of our fathers has appointed you to know his desire and to see the righteous one and to hear the voice from his mouth because you shall be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you delay? Rise up, be immersed, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of Yahweh. And it came to be when I returned to Jerusalem, and while I was praying in the set-apart place, I came to be in a trance. And I saw him saying to me, Hurry and get out of Jerusalem speedily because they shall not accept your witness concerning me. And I said, Master, they know that in every congregation I was imprisoning and beating those who believe in, on you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephano, Stephen, was shed, I also was standing by giving my approval to his death and keeping the garments of those who were killing him. And he said to me, Go, because I shall send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they were listening to him until this word about going to the Gentiles. And then they lifted up their voice saying, Away with such a one from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. As they were shouting and tearing their garments and throwing dust into the air. <laughs> I can just see that. It's kind of like these boys are getting out of hand, aren't they? They are losing it. Verse 24, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined by flogging in order to find out why they were shouting so against him. And as they were stretching out with straps, Shaul said to the captain who was standing by, Is it permitted for you to whip a man who is Roman and uncondemned? And when the captain heard, he went and reported this to the commander saying, Watch what you are about to do for this man is a Roman. And having come, the commander said to him, Say to me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. And the commander answered, With a large sum of money I obtained this citizenship. And Shaul said, But I was even born so. Then at once those who were about to examine him <laughs> withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. And on the next day, intending to know for certain why he was accused by the Yehudim, he released him and commanded the chief priests and all their council to come and brought Shaul down and set him before them. All right, now we're going to start reading in 23 verse 1. Everybody with me so far? All right. And Shaul, looking intently at the council, said, Men, brothers, I have lived in all good conscience before Elohim until this day. And the high priest, Hananiah, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Shaul said to him, Elohim is going to strike you, whitewashed wall. And see, that's what I'm saying. He is not a pushover, okay? He, he's sitting there in a lot of trouble. He's getting commanded to get whacked in the mouth, and, he, and he's, Elohim's going to smack you. Whitewashed, added, added, added insult to injury, okay? All right. <clears throat> Continuing in verse 3. And do you sit judging me according to the Torah? And do you command me to be struck contrary to the Torah? Why would Paul bring up the Torah? Could it be because he, he did walk orderly keeping the Torah and it was important to him and it meant something to him and if we were going to... Uh, judge him and carry on like this, we need to be going by the Torah? Crazy talk. Crazy talk. Okay. And those who stood by said, Do you revile the high priest of Elohim? And Shaul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it has been written, You shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Now why would someone who taught against the Torah, quote Exodus twenty two twenty eight? 28, Why, why would he quote Exodus twenty two twenty eight 28 and, and be sincerely apologetic when he found out that's the high priest, not just any old whitewashed wall? <laughs> okay? Things that, you know, 
th things that when you start looking a little more closely, kind of shift the paradigm, I mean. All right. <clears throat> Verse 6. Now, Shaul perceiving that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, cried out in the council, Men, brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I'm being judged concerning the expectation in the resurrection of the dead. Now, why did he say that? Because Yahshua is what? He's the first of the first fruits. If you're going to proclaim Yahshua, you've got to be proclaiming the resurrection. All right? And when he said this, there came a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the crowd was divided, for the Sadducees say, There is no resurrection, nor messenger, nor spirit. But the Pharisees confessed both, and where there was a great uproar. And certain of the scribes of the party of the Pharisees were earnestly contending, saying, We find no evil in this man. And if a spirit or a messenger has spoken to him, let us not fight against Elohim. And a great dissension having come, the commander, fearing lest Shaul would be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the body of the soldiers, uh, the body of soldiers to go down and seize him from their midst and bring him into the barracks. And on the following night, the master stood by him and said, Take courage, Shaul, for as you have witnessed for me in Jerusalem, so you have to bear witness where? At Rome too. And when it became day, some of the Yehudim made a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Shaul. And those making this conspiracy were more than 40, and having come to the chief priests and elders said, We have bound ourselves under a great oath not to eat uh, at all until we have killed Shaul. Now then, you, with the council, inform the commander to have him brought down to you tomorrow as intending to examine him, I, I'm sorry, examine more exactly all about him. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. And when Shaul's sister's son, I don't know why it just says, his ne it doesn't say his nephew, but when Shaul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered into the barracks and reported to Shaul. And Shaul, having called one of the captains to him, said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has somewhat to report to him. He indeed then took him and led him to the commander and said, The prisoner Shaul called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you, having somewhat to say to you. And the commander, having taken him by the hand, went aside by themselves and asked, What is it that you have to report to me? And he said, The Yehudim have agreed to ask that you bring Shaul down to the council tomorrow as intending to acquire more exactly about him. Therefore, do not let them persuade you, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him and have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink until they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. And the commander dismissed the young man, having commanded him, inform no one that you reported this to me. And having called near a certain two captains, he said, Get 200 soldiers ready to go to Caesarea, and 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen after the third hour of the night. And provide beasts on which to place Shaul and bring him safely to Felix the governor. Having written a letter in this form, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor, Felix, greetings. This man, having been seized by the Yehudim and being about to be killed by them, I rescued, having come with a body of soldiers, having learned that he was a Roman. And desiring to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their what? Of their Torah. But there was no charge against him deserving death or chains. And when I was informed that there was to be a plot against the man by the Yehudim, I sent him immediately to you, having also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Be strong. So the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Shaul and brought him by night to uh, Antipatris. This is, we're next, 2330. And on the next day, they left the horsemen 
to go on with him and return to the barracks, who, having come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Shaul to him. And the governor, having read it and having asked what province he was and being informed that he was from Kilikia, said, I shall hear you when your accusers arrive also. And he commanded him to, keep, to be kept in Herod's palace. Okay, now we're going to start in 24 verse 1. And after five days, the high priest, Kananiah, came down with the elders and a certain speaker, uh, Tertullus. And they brought charges against Shaul before the governor. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Having obtained great peace through you and reforms being brought to this nation by your forethought, we accept it always and in all places most excellent, Felix, with all things. But in order not to hinder you any further, I beg you to hear us briefly in your gentleness. For having found this man a plague who stirs up dissension among all the Yehudim throughout the world, he's, he's pretty good, isn't he? Uh, throughout the world, and ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, hmm. who also tried to profane the set-apart place in whom we, we, uh, in, in whom we seized and wished to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came along and with much violence took him out of our hands. Command, that's kind of funny, isn't it? We were going to perform much violence, but with much violence he took him out of our hands. Commanding his accusers to come to you. And by examining him yourself, you shall be able to know all these matters in which we accuse him. And the Yehudim also agreed, maintaining that these matters were so. And when the governor had motioned him to speak, Shaul answered, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge of this nation, I gladly defend myself, seeing you are able to know that it is not more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to what? To worship. Huh. And they neither found me in the set-apart place. What are those next three words? Disputing with anyone nor stirring up the crowd, either in the congregation or in the city, nor are they able to prove the charges which they now accuse me. And this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, look at here, so I worship the Elohim of my fathers, believing all that has been written in the Torah and the prophets. All right? You see... Paul keeps trying to show that what they have been informed about him is not so. We'll share something with you in a minute that, that you, you may find enlightening, but um, read, moving right along. Having an expectation in Elohim, which they themselves also wait for, and... I'm sorry, that there is to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the righteous and the unrighteous, having an expectation in Elohim, which they themselves also wait for, that there is to be a resurrection of the dead, both the righteous and the unrighteous. And in this I exercise myself to have a clear conscience towards Elohim and men always. And after many years, I came to bring kind deeds to my nation. And what else? And offerings. Why in the world would he need to go, go offer offerings? All that stuff's right? Wrong. <laughs> Verse 18. At which time certain Yehudim from Asia found me cleansed in the set-apart place. Now why would he need to be cleansed? Why couldn't he just walk on up there not worrying about the, I, the veil's gone? <laughs> All right. Cleansed in the set-apart place, neither with a crowd nor with disturbance, who ought, to, who ought to be present before you to bring charges if they have any matter against me. Or else, let these themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, other than for this one declaration which I cried out standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you today. And having heard this, having known more exactly about the way Felix put them off, saying, 
When Lysias, the commander, comes down, I shall decide your case. And he ordered the captain to keep Shaul and to have ease and not to forbid any of his friends to attend to him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a female Yehudite, he sent for Shaul and heard him concerning the belief in the Messiah. And as he reasoned about righteousness, I thought it said in, in the Torah that righteousness is when we guard to keep all his commands. Something about, I don't know. Right. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, For the present, go. And, and when I find time, I shall send for you. At the same time, too, he was anticipating that silver would be given him by Shoal, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often <laughs> and conversed with him. But after two years had passed, Porcius Festus, and I, I'm going to tell you, Porcius Festus, you're not going to believe me, means swine-like or swinish, and Festus means festival. This boy was named Pig Fest. <laughs> he really, really was. Okay? That's where we get the word porcine and festival. Okay? Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and wishing to do the Yehudim a favor, Felix left Shaul bound. All right? 25 verse 1. Festus, Lisa called him Festus. <laughs> Therefore, having come to the province three days later, went up to Caesarea, went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, and the high priest and the chief men of the Yehudim informed him against Shaul, and they begged him, asking a favor against him. They're really bitter boys, you know it. They are really, really bitter. Uh, that he would send him to Jerusalem, making a plot along the way to kill him. Then indeed Festus answered that Shaul should be kept in Caesarea, and that he himself was about to set out shortly. Therefore he said, Let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. And having spent more than ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea, and on the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Shaul to be brought. And when he had come, the Ehudim, who had come down from Jerusalem, stood about bringing many and heavy charges against Shaul, which they were unable to prove. While Shaul said in his own defense, wait a minute, look what he's going to say here, neither against the Torah of the Yehudim, nor against the set apart place, nor against Caesar, Caesar, did I commit any sin. Why does he keep bringing up this stuff about the Torah? He's, 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 if he's just saying it to get out of trouble, this is what I was going to tell you about a while ago. If he is just saying this to get out of trouble, the stuff about, I'll keep the Torah. <laughs> All right. If he's just saying this to get out of trouble because the Jews are plotting to kill him just as soon as the Romans aren't protecting him, if he really wanted to just say something for the sake of getting out of trouble, he could have said, these Jews seek to kill me because I serve the gods of Rome, Festus. They want to kill me for serving the same gods which you serve, Festus. That's what they're wanting to kill me for. All right? If he's just trying to get out of trouble with the Romans, that is. But that's not what he does, is it? He keeps bringing up the Torah because he's a Torah keeper. Being falsely accused of teaching against the Torah. Verse 9. But Festus, Festus, wishing to do the Yehudim a favor, answering Shaul, said, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be judged before me there concerning these matters? And Shaul said, I am standing at Caesar's judgment seat where I should be judged. To the Yehudim, I have done no wrong as you, well, you know well enough. For if indeed I do wrong or have committed whatever deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if there is none at all in these matters of which these men accuse me, no one is able to give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, 
having talked with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Certain days having passed, Sovereign Agrippa and Bernice, says Bernice in your KJV, I think, Bernice, came to Caesarea to greet Festus. And when they'd spent many days there, Festus laid Shaul's case before the sovereign, saying, There is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner, and whom the chief priests and the elders of the Yehudim informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. And then I answered, and uh, to them I answered, it is not the Roman practice to give up any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has a chance to answer for himself concerning the charges against him. They, therefore, having come together without any delay, I sat on the judgment seat and the next day, uh, the next day and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge against him such as I expected, but had some questions about him about their own worship. And about a certain Yahshua who had died, whom Shaul was claiming to be alive. And, and being uncertain how to investigate these matters, I asked whether he wished to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Shaul appealed uh, to be kept from the decision of Augustus, I ordered him to be kept until uh, I send to Caesar. And Agrippa said to Festus, I was wishing also to hear the man myself. And, and he said, Tomorrow you shall hear him. Therefore, on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice, having come with a great show and having entered, entered the place of, of hearing with the commanders and the eminent men of the city, Shaul was brought in at the order of Festus. And Festus said, Sovereign Agrippa and all the men present here with us, you see the one about whom all the community of the Yehudim pleaded with me, both at Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to be living any longer. But I have found that he had committed none at all deserving death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus. I decided to send him. I have no definite matter to write to my master concerning him. Therefore, I brought him out before you and most of, uh, most of all before you, Sovereign Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I might have somewhat to write. You see that? He can't even come up with a good reason to send him to, to Caesar. So he said, I need some help from you, Agrippa. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to signify the charges against him. All right, All right so then we're going to be skipping forward a little bit. Paul is then brought before Agrippa and Bernice, and he testifies about his upbringing and how he was persecuted, uh, how he has persecuted the Nazarene, and about what Yahshua did when he struck Paul blind on the road to Damascus. And now in chapter 26, we're going to start reading in verse 19. And it says, Therefore, sovereign Agrippa, this is Paul speaking here, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and in all the country of Yehuda and, and the Gentiles that they should do what? Repent and turn to Elohim and do works worthy of repentance. That's why the Yehudim seized me in the set-apart place and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from Elohim, to this day I stand, witnessing both the small and great, saying, look at this, Nil else than what the prophets and Moshe said would come. I thought he was teaching against Moshe. This stuff just keeps coming up, folks. Verse 23, that the Messiah would suffer, would be the first to rise from the dead. He would proclaim light to the people and to, be, and to the Gentiles. And while saying this in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Shaul, you are mad. Much learning is turning you to madness. But Shaul said, I'm not mad, most excellent Festus, but I speak words of truth and sense. For the sovereign before whom I also speak boldly knows these matters. For I am persuaded that none of these are hidden from him. For this has not been done in a corner. Sovereign Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. 
And Agrippa said to Shaul, Agrippa said to Shaul, with a little, you might persuade me to become, that says a Messianite in our ISR, it says Christiani in the Aramaic, all right, but a Nazarene, all right, you, you might, you might persuade me to become one of you. And Shaul said, much or little, I pray that Elohim, to Elohim that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become such as I also am, except for these chains. That's pretty neat, isn't it? It's pretty neat, except for these chains. And having said this, the sovereign stood up, as well as the governor and Bernike and those sitting with him. And having withdrawn, they spoke to each other, saying, this man is doing none at all deserving death or chains. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. All right. Now, in chapter 27, we read about Paul's voyage to Rome. All right. uh, and after getting to Rome, we read the following. In chapter 28, we're going to start reading in verse 17. And it came to be after three days that Shaul called the leaders of the Yehudim, of the Jews, together. And when they had come together, he said to them, Men, brothers, though I have done none at all against our people or the practices of our fathers, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, intended to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. Wow. All right. You see, Paul's message has been consistent all the way through this whole ordeal. He spent years between point A and this point right here. Now, I want you to look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, page 1150 in the 98 ISR. We're going to start reading verse 1. And, and this, is the same, this is the same gentleman who has been getting accused of lawlessness, Torahlessness, all, all through here by the, by the, the Yehudim. Verse 1. As to the coming of our master, Yahshua Messiah, sounds like he's being consistent with his other preaching there, and our gathering together to him, that'd be the resurrection. We ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled in mind or troubled, either by spirit or word or by letter, as if from us, as if the day of Yahweh has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first, and the man of what? Lawlessness is to be revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worshipped so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Do you not remember that I told you this while I was still with you? And now you know what restrains for him to be revealed in his time. For the, look at this, the secret of lawlessness, it says mystery of iniquity in the KJV, the secret of lawlessness is already at work. Only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. And then the lawless one shall be revealed, whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming. I just want to ask this question real quick. If he's going to consume the, the, the lawless one, who wants to be in league with him? You know? I, I would say if Paul's warning about about this situation right here, he probably regards himself as not being a lawless person. Okay, he's in league with the lawful ones. Okay, verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth but have delighted in the unrighteousness. What's the, the opposite of unrighteousness? Righteousness, okay. 
But we ought to give thanks to Elohim always for you, brothers, beloved by the Master, because Elohim, from the beginning, chose you to be saved in the set-apartness of spirit and belief in the truth, unto which he called you by our good news for the obtaining of the esteem of our Master, Yahshua, Messiah. So then, brothers, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by letter. And our Master, Yahshua, him, Messiah himself, and our Elohim and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting encouragement and good expectation through favor, encourage your hearts and establish you in every word and work. That doesn't sound like somebody who's, who's uh, uh, teaching against lawfulness, is it? Matter of fact, it sounds like he's kind of warning us against that. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, page 1183, and we're going to start reading in verse 3. Now this ain't Paul talking here, is it? This isn't Paul talking here. <laughs> Verse 3, and by this we know that we know him, if we guard his commands. And the one who says, I know him and does not guard his commands, would that include Paul? Okay, all right. And, and, and the one who says, I know him and does not guard his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. All right. Now, if, if Paul was saying what the Yehudim and all these people in Christianity and many actually in Messianic groups, if Paul was really saying what they say he is, then, then he'd be a liar, and the truth would not be in him. That's just a witness there. But whoever guards his word, truly the love of Elohim has been perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he stays in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Listen, folks, the denominations out there are not walking as he walked. I'm sorry I hate to bring it up, but it's, it's the fact, all right? And, and, and also in a lot of Messianic groups, they're not walking as he walked. It's kind of just a blend of all this stuff. All right, John, uh, 1 John 3 and verse 3. And everyone having this expectation in him cleanses himself as he is clean. Everyone doing sin also does lawlessness. Paul was just talking about. The man of lawlessness, okay? Everyone doing sin also does lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Everyone staying in him does not sin, and everyone sinning has neither sinned him nor known him. And our last passage today is going to be Matthew chapter 5. It's not what you think, but it's part of it. <laughs> Matthew 5. And we're going to start reading in verse 19. Matthew 5, 19, and it says, Whoever, and this is Yahshua speaking at the Sermon on the Mount, Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens, but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. And I think this is one of the reasons that Paul kept appealing to the Torah. Okay? Whoever breaks and teaches to break will be least. Whoever t uh, uh, does and teaches to keep will be called great. And I think this is one of the reasons that Paul kept appealing to the Torah. And isn't it interesting that Paul was charged all the way back when he went to meet with the apostles in Jerusalem of breaking and teaching to break the Torah. That's what it started with. But Paul keeps insisting that the Torah is binding and that he has never taught against it. Four times, and what we read here, at a minimum of four times, I think it's more than four, Paul either demonstrates by his actions or says that the charges against him are false. And you know what? 
the Jews wanted to kill him for the false charges. Okay? And the Christians, and the Christians, get this, are still trying to prove that the false charges are true. I'm going to say that again in case you missed it. The Jews wanted to kill him for false charges, and the Christians are still trying to prove that the false charges are true. So as to use Paul's words to do away with the very Torah of which he said that I never spoke against or taught against. All right? He called it the mystery of iniquity or the secret of lawlessness. Remember, Paul did not come to straighten Yahshua out. It happened the other way around. And so now, when you hear someone say that we don't have to keep the, the Torah because Paul said dot, 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 you can say, Paul said what? <laughs> That's not what he said. Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you his complete contentment.